Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues and friends from the four IIS regional federations. My name is Rosana Pelayo, principal investigator of the Mexican Institute for Social Security, dedicated to immunobiology of hematological malignancies, and now at your service in the IIS Education Committee, and now as a chair. Thank you all for joining the very last of the IOIS Frontiers webinar series on COVID-19. This program, as you have seen, has provided the opportunity to unite the global immunological community and respond to this unexpected pandemic we are facing. So we wish to thank Frontiers for being a great host and in collaboration to IOIS for promoting international cooperation. We are grateful to our invited lecturers, always open to share knowledge in such an exciting time for, for scientists. And of course, to attendees, especially today to the Latin American and Caribbean societies of immunology. We all know the importance of local expertise and collective work in the fight against these and future challenges. Thank you to those who foster development of preventive and therapeutic approaches. The greater our capacity to advance, the less vulnerable we will be. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexis Kalergis, an extraordinary scientist who never stops evolving and is a great expert in vaccine development against respiratory viruses. Dr. Kalergis is PhD in microbiology and immunology from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine and is currently holding a full professor position in the School of Biological Sciences at the School of Medicine at the Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. He's founder and director of the Millennium Institute of Immunology and Immunotherapy, a center of excellence by the Federation of Clinical Immunology Societies, which is committed to transfer basic knowledge into prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of pathologies of health priority in Latin America. He has generated a fascinating body of work on molecular interactions that regulates the synapse between T cells and dendritic cells and the role in immunity against pathogens and tumors. As we will learn today, relevant findings on the pathology of respiratory viral infections has led Kalergis Laboratory to, de to develop novel vaccine approaches against uh, RSV that strengthen TDC synapse. They have now designed a vaccine for SARS-CoV-2, which is currently in preclinical evaluation. So Alexis, we thank and welcome you to this IOIS program. Before I leave you with the audience, uh, just a reminder to attendees, please make your questions in the Q&A chat. Uh, I will take them to, to Alexis after his presentation. And also, if you have any sound problems, please please make uh, sure your browser is, uh, uh, is not uh, on mute. Welcome, Alexis. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Pelayo, Rosana, Frank, for such a nice intro introduction. And I also thank uh, the IUES and the Allied for the invitation to present today here the work that we've been doing on the interaction between um, pathogens and the immune system with emphasis on respiratory pathogens and um, also a little bit of outreach I will discuss today. So if I can get the first slide. Um, so I, I will focus on the way um, some respiratory pa pathogens uh, might uh, manipulate the immune system and uh, how this could be important for the uh, design of vaccines. So um, as we all know, uh, several uh, infections have been uh, troublesome in the history of humanity. Here is an example of uh, smallpox, a major uh, cause of death that um, is not here 
anymore in the planet, thanks to the uh, pioneer work of people like Lady Mary Worley uh, in the, and, and Edward Jenner in the 1700s. Um, Lady Mary Worley was the one that brought this knowledge from Turkey. She was part of the diplomatic um, commission from England and she was very influential in terms of getting um, attention paid to uh, vaccines. At that time, virulization was the name. And then uh, Ethel Jenner initiated some of the first studies to uh, come up with a vaccine against uh, smallpox, which is no longer there thanks exactly to the, not only the availability of the vaccine, not only to the development of the vaccine, but also uh, to the efforts of the WHO to make this vaccine available to everybody. And that led in the late 70s to the eradication of this very serious disease. And um, every time a vaccine that's been shown to be safe and efficacious uh, is introduced in a community, we see that the incidence of disease uh, goes down. And that's the case for polio, rubiola, mumps, and uh, it used to be the case for measles. And I will make the case of measles in the next slides. But we uh, all um, immunologists kind of uh, acknowledge that as shown in this slide, the use of vaccine, the coverage of vaccine, which is shown in the blue line, um, leads to the reduction of several important diseases that uh, affect humans. And um, also a big challenge is the gap between developing countries and industrialized countries. That's something that is very important to take into account when we are working on vaccines because uh, manufacturing of vaccines can be a big challenge. Um, and as shown this uh, figure from a paper that we published in Frontiers in Immunology a couple of years ago, uh, as you see here in this map, uh, pretty much every country uses vaccines, but only a few countries have the capacity to uh, produce them. And that's been a problem that we are confronting with the current pandemic with COVID-19. Now, um, going back to vaccines and the use of vaccines, um, diseases such as measles that were considered uh, controlled or even eliminated in some countries um, in the 2000s, thanks to the use of vaccine, are uh, coming back due to vaccine hesitancy, which is increasing um, in several places of the world. And that has led us to um, work on this um, as scientists, we have this, I think, obligation. We, we need, and especially immunologists, to communicate the importance of um, just uh, using vaccines in the community. And for that, I will show you a video in the next slide that uh, describes an um, uh, um, initiative that we have been working with the students in Chile, um, with several universities from the country, uh, that we called Museum for Immunology and Vaccination that is um, looking to, is trying to remind to society uh, the importance of vaccines and also um, bring to their uh, knowledge and to their realization that these diseases such as measles, um, for example, is a good example. Uh, there was a cases of tetanus uh, a few, a couple of years ago um, that uh, shows that the, those pathogens are still out there. So the perception of risk can be put um, right in place. And if I, if the video can be shown, it's in Spanish, but has some subtitles that you can look at. Vamos a hacer la inauguración de esta primera muestra del Museo de la Inmunología y de la Vacunación, que se llama Eternalismo. Principalmente son alumnos que fueron los creadores de las ideas de lo que vamos a mostrar. Junto con la diseñadora está el doctor Calergis y también hay gente del laboratorio, eh, alumnos de doctorado, investigadores que vinieron a colaborar. Diez de las grandes. Diez de estas, sí. Sí. Hacemos el primero. 
El objetivo de la muestra es posicionar el concepto de la comunicación científica, en particular nos interesa enseñar cuál es la, el origen de estas enfermedades y al mismo tiempo demostrar que la vacunación es una manera de prevenirlas. Enfermedades. Entonces, de enfermedades sería o de paretidis. Traer a la Trinidad, que fue la directora creativa, la diseñadora, la que armó la mayoría de los proyectos, fue darle vida a eso, fue darle vida a, la, a las cosas que nosotros teníamos en mente. Claro, que nos falta ahora es traer... Sentí que era algo muy nuevo, muy innovador, mezclar dos áreas, que es el diseño del arte por un lado, y la ciencia y la inmunología por el otro. Al principio fue súper difícil porque ellos manejan ya un cierto lenguaje científico que ni yo ni el resto de las personas que no estamos involucradas en el área de la ciencia lo sabe. Nos bajó de, del mundo científico y nos dijo así la gente lo va a poder entender. Entonces fue como ese papel que nos faltaba. Al principio ellos tenían su lenguaje, yo tenía el mío, socábamos todo el rato y después cuando logramos llegar a un punto medio y poder comunicarnos de una mejor manera, fue que todo empezó a fluir, el museo empezó a avanzar y hasta lo que tenemos ahora. Se pueden hacer las cosas cuando uno quiere. Nosotros partimos de nada, partimos de hagan un museo. Y ahora ya estamos a puertas de, de estrenarlo, entonces con eso uno se queda. Bueno, muchas gracias a todos los presentes. Realmente estoy muy emocionado por la convocatoria. Hemos denominado esta muestra de eternalismo porque persigue incluir el pasado, el presente y el futuro de la inmunología y la vacunación. Es decir, un rango eterno de tiempo. Como autoridades no podemos más que felicitar y agradecer muy sinceramente esta iniciativa. La inmunología y la vacunación en la historia de la humanidad tienen logros importantes que hoy se continúa trabajando por mejorar la salud de todos los seres humanos. Uno de los objetivos que tiene en particular el Instituto Milenio es que la ciencia sea ciudadana, es decir, que la ciencia sea de todo. Los estudiantes son claves porque son creativos, son dedicados, comprometidos y muchos de ellos ven esto como una oportunidad de proyectarse desde su quehacer universitario hacia la sociedad. Algunas familias lamentablemente cometen el error de optar por no vacunar a sus hijos o hijas y estos estudiantes se dieron cuenta que a través de esta iniciativa podrían aportar a resolver este problema que es de altísimo impacto a nivel mundial la vacunación no es propia, no solo yo me estoy protegiendo, yo estoy protegiendo a ustedes, lo estoy protegiendo a todos, o sea la vacunación es un concepto súper lindo y hay uno que se llama la vacunación del rebaño, el rebaño seríamos todos nosotros, entonces si un, una, una oveja de ese rebaño no está vacunada, empieza a contagiar a toda la otra. De una clase de inmunología nace un poco también esta inquietud, las ganas de hacer un museo, las ganas de poder comunicar de distinta manera y que no todo quede en un libro, no todo quede en un paper o en una publicación fuera del país, sino comunicar también lo que ellos están haciendo en su país y a su gente. Hay que enfocarse en hacer divulgación, eso es lo importante, en llegar, en transmitir, en encantar. La divulgación científica tiene como objetivo, finalmente, que el conocimiento que generamos sirva a la sociedad para construir en nuestro imaginario, para inspirarnos, para tomar decisiones, y eso es un rol fundamental de la ciencia. Que es educar más que todo, es, es llevar la ciencia a la gente. La verdad que he pasado muchos años bien encerrada en un laboratorio, conversando harto con alumnos, pero de temas muy científicos y del experimento, y hacerlos pensar, y el pensamiento científico, como razonar. Y eso fue el propósito que en un momento le dije al doctor Calé, que me encantaría hacer algo distinto, de difusión, de poder llegar más a la población, de salir, de mostrarse un poquito más. Para mí también es un tremendo aporte, esto, una oportunidad que uno no, no deja de poder hacer cosas nuevas en la vida, digamos. Hay tiempo para todo. So in terms of the, uh, the work in my lab focuses on the interaction between um, dendritic cells and pathogens. So usually these cells are able to uh, recognize infections. We show here uh, uh, some cartoons for epithelial cells getting exposed to respiratory pathogens. 
And when that takes place, the neutric cells get activated and they prime uh, T cells and T cells have B cells to make antibodies. And um, we have been working on four different pathogens, uh, the respiratory syncytial virus, the human metanoma virus, the hunter virus, and recently uh, on SARS-CoV-2. And uh, this interaction between T cells and dendritic cells is important to prime immune cells to recognize and control uh, infections. But these pathogens have developed ways for uh, blocking this interaction and eventually preventing the initiation of the immune response. So um, we have been um, studying as to how these pathogens, uh, in particular um, respiratory viruses, can influence the immune response during infection. And um, by doing so, they promote an inflammatory response that can be detrimental for the host and, uh, and that is not able to clear the infection, but is able for the virus to uh, pass from one person to the next. So we uh, focus on the interaction between um, T cells and, 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 um, and dendritic cells. And as shown in these uh, slides, we found that cells infected with RSV um, show a reduced capacity to activate um, um, T cells, dendritic cells that have been exposed to respiratory syncytial virus are unable to prime T cells. And we found that the mechanism led was, due, was probably due to the lack of um, immunological synapses between uh, dendritic cells in red and T cells in, in green. And um, we quantified this inhibition and it was about 60% of inhibition of uh, T cell activation and synapse assembly. So we propose the hypothesis that this process of uh, T cell um, activation and synapse assembly uh, in response to anti-loaded uh, anti presenting cells was interfered by a protein from the virus able to um, go to the membrane, surface, the, the surface membrane of the dendritic cells and uh, by doing that, prevent the activation of the T cell. So the virus, in this case, RSV, respiratory essential virus, has uh, 10 genes that encode for 11 proteins. So we tested each of these proteins for the their ability to impair synapse assembly using a uh, um, um, artificial system. We did also this in vivo with um, transduced uh, dendritic cells, but I'll show you the data from the planar lipid bilayer assays. So these uh, bilayers contain antigen as NAC plus peptide, addition molecules, and we um, use these bilayers to activate T cells that have the right T cell receptor recognizing the uh, peptide NAC complex in the presence or the absence of uh, vital proteins. And uh, we found that um, in the presence uh, of one protein, this process was blocked. So in when there was no viral protein, we could see clustering of ICAM-1 and T cell receptor clustering. One of the RSV proteins, M2, made no changes in this uh, process, so it worked as a nice control. And then we tried protein N, that is the nucleocapsid of the virus, and found that um, the synapse was um, interfered, was prevented for taking place. So that was the first result we obtained. We did several other experiments. I'm showing you, showing you here another set of data where we quantify the formation of synapses between uh, T cells and, um, and these lipid bilayers. Um, the MAC is in green and the TCI in red. So every time you see a yellow dot, is this, is this, um, it's, a syn it's a synapse. This is the control assay. This is the same assay in the presence of the N protein, suggesting so that this protein by itself seems to be able to uh, prevent this um, the formation of the synapse. So we checked whether the synapse was present on, uh, on we checked whether this uh, neutral protein from the virus was present on the membrane of uh, infected cells. And as was shown before, the fusion protein and the G protein from RSV is on the membrane of cells, but the um, nucleoprotein was 
at that time when we published this data um, was not previously described to reach the membrane of infected cells. And we found both by flow cytometry as well as by uh, confocal microscopy that the end protein of RSB makes it to the um, dendritic cell surface quite at the same level as the F and the G proteins do, suggesting that this protein might actually interfere with the function of uh, the dendritic cell surface at the capacity to prime T cells. So uh, we concluded that we found a mechanism of interference with the T cell activation by the, the respiratory syncytial virus, and that mechanism involves the interference with the synapse assembly between uh, antigen presenting cells and T cells. And we found that one molecule from the virus, the nuclear protein, might be responsible of preventing this process. And of course, when you find a molecule like this, you know, you start looking, um, when you find a, a new function for a molecule, just a checking around whether this was a common feature and, and, and just going back to missiles, apparently the missiles nuclear protein also has the capacity to interfere with the activation of T cells. Uh, so that goes along what we found for the respiratory syncytial virus, and this might be a common feature of respiratory viruses. So after found, finding um, a virulence factor from, uh, from this respiratory virus, we could use this information, this basic knowledge to uh, create a vaccine, and we could target that molecule from the virus. And we did that uh, by generating recombinant um, attenuated bacteria expressing that antigen. Um, so we could use this recombinant vaccine to induce immunity against uh, RSV. And uh, we, as I will show you, went uh, all the way into um, different, different regulatory agencies after doing a bunch of preclinical studies and concluded this with a clinical study. So these respiratory viruses, they induce um, inflammatory response in the airways. So the, um, this, this sort of detrimental immune response needs to be counteracted with a vaccine. So the vaccine not only has to induce immunity, but it needs to induce the right kind of immunity, knowing that already these viruses lead to an immunity that might be detrimental for the host. So uh, if we want to just push a vaccine all the way to uh, clinical use, there are several steps that need to be covered. First, uh, several animal models to show uh, safety, immunogenicity, and the mechanism of the vaccine, then um, go into uh, phase one um, to check for safety and as a secondary outcome, immunogenicity in humans. And for that, uh, GMP production, which stands for good manufacture practice of the vaccine needed in order to comply with the regulations. Then phase two evaluates um, uh, I mean, in every phase, the safety is evaluated, but phase two focuses on immunogenicity and phase three focuses on the um, um, efficacy, efficacy of the vaccine. So for this vaccine, uh, for the respiratory syncytial virus, we uh, designed the vaccine, we made the um, GMP formulation in order to comply with the Chilean and the international regulations. Then we tried this in several animal models, in mice, uh, cotton rats, rats. Uh, we did in, even a study in cattle, in, in, in baby cows, um, in order to comply with the regulatory agencies so we could try this vaccine in uh, humans. And uh, just to show you a little bit of data, um, in animal models, we found in mice, for example, that the vaccine is able to prevent the weight loss due to RSV infection that is shown in, this, um, in these animals. Um, so one single immunization with the vaccine prevents weight loss. And as shown here on the right, in the absence, in, in a naive animal, we see replication of the virus in the airways but uh, the vaccine completely prevent 
prevents this uh, replication of the virus. And we, um, as I said, after several clinical, preclinical models, I'm sorry, preclinical models, we, um, we needed to comply with the toxicology in good laboratory practices, as well as immunogenicity, in order to get regulatory approval for a phase one trial. And we did that and performed a phase one trial uh, for this vaccine in healthy adults, showing that the vaccine was um, immunogenic and safe in this um, phase one trial. So uh, this is the current map for the vaccines um, that are in, pro in, in the process of development uh, um, in, in the world. And our vaccine is already um, finishing up, um, just completed a phase one uh, trial and moving uh, into a phase two trial. Now, if we wanted, and just wanted to give you that uh, brief introduction about RSV and the just, I didn't show you, of course, all the data um, associated with the vaccine, but I wanted to focus this talk on, uh, on COVID-19. And um, so based on the um, results we obtained with the respiratory essential virus, we decided to approach this, uh, this problem by working on a vaccine. And this is also a respiratory virus, has uh, 14 um, open reading frame, frames. And um, we could focus on um, the first, we need to focus on the, what we know about the disease so far, uh, not only affects the respiratory system, but also it's able to affect the, the intestinal um, gastrointestinal system. Um, it's been, um, there have been several reports on effects in the central nervous system and also has, um, can affect other tissues such as the skin, for example. And uh, th the fact that there have been several reports um, on the effects of, of COVID-19 or of SARS-CoV-2 on the um, central nervous system, we, um, we you know, had previously shown that that also seems to be the case for the respiratory syncytial virus. And uh, we published a paper a couple of years ago that's been quite uh, cited as a result of the studies that are being performed now on, on, on COVID-19. So we found on, on uh, different um, animal models that, um, that um, the genetic material for, for, for RSV could be found on this uh, central nervous system of different animals. We did this in mice and rats, either the RNA or the uh, antigens um, from uh, the RSV could be, find, could be found on this uh, central nervous system of these animals. And when we did different um, um, learning tests, as shown on this assay here, it's called Morris Warden Maze. It's a test that measures the ability of an um, animal, uh, could be a, a rat or a, a mouse, um, to find a hidden platform that is in the pool with water. Uh, and this uh, pool is in a room with beach cues. So the first time you do the experiment, the, the animal swims around looking for the platform um, randomly. But the rat, for example, could learn that the platform is closer to the triangle, farther from the circle. So the next time you do the assay, the animal knows that needs to swim towards the triangle and away from the circle. And if you do these experiments in, in rats or mice, and this data come, comes from this data comes from, from rats, um, mock are the controls, the um, uninfected animals. You see that the first time you do the assay, it takes them about 75, 80 seconds to find the platform. Uh, but the second time they learned where it is and it takes them just you know, 20 seconds and they, they become very good at finding the platform. But animals, in this case rats, that were infected with RSV, and this is something that we are doing after the acute respiratory infection, this is um, several weeks after the infection, and we've seen this all the way up to six months after uh, exposure to the virus, 
you see that there is a significant um, uh, re reduction in the efficiency uh, or, or the response of these um, animals as compared to the uh, uninfected controls. So the um, the animals take longer to find the platform suggesting that they are less able to perform on this uh, learning test. Then we did a second test that's called uh, marble burning behavior. So this was done in mice and these animals will hide everything that is on the, uh, that, uh, that is over the bedding in the cages that they live. Uh, they will hide it under the bedding and shown here um, an uninfected animal will hide all the marbles uh, under the bedding because if they, they, they compare this to um, um, food or, 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 or pups, um, they, they will hide food from competitors and they will hide um, pups or, uh, or like the uh, offspring from uh, predators. Um, and, as, and as shown here in the bottom, uh, animals that were previously exposed with RSV show a reduced capacity of hiding these marbles. Uh, suggesting again an impairment in the uh, central nervous system. Um, so we find that um, uh, also these animals showed a reduced response in the um, long term potentiation uh, of the hippocampus. As shown here, um, control animals in white have a pretty strong um, long term potentiation response. Uh, in the hippocampal region, as compared in red with the RSV exposed animals, they do not respond to this um, test as well as the as the as the uninfected animals. On the contrary, uh, RSV infected animals show increased long-term depression responses, suggesting a reduced uh, activity uh, in the hippocampus. So uh, if, if these animals, mice or rats, are immunized with our vaccine, these uh, reduced responses in the, um, these reduced responses in the um, uh, learning test are um, sort of restored. They, 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 do, they do better if an appropriate immune response is triggered. Um, so as, as shown here, um, uh, mice or rats, in this case, are mice infected with RSV, are uh, less capable of hiding marbles as compared to the controls. But if the animals are vaccinated, so if the proper immune response is triggered um, with the vaccine, then they are equally efficient as the control to hide marbles, suggesting that if the right immune response is triggered, then the... Um, the um, the, the viral infection does not cause a deficiency in the uh, immune response um, and, and, and the, the immune response is um, the, the right one for clearing the virus without significant um, impairment in the cognitive function. So we uh, thought that this had to do with the crossing of the blood brain barrier. So we used an antibody that um, is, is anti-CD49 that prevents the crossing of cells um, through the blood-brain barrier. And shown here in the graph, as um, we increase the doses of this anti-CD49 antibody, uh, even, in the, even after infection with, with the virus, with the, with the respiratory syncytial virus, the um, capacity of hiding marbles was becoming um, better and better to become not, not significantly different than the uh, uninfected animals. So yes, in that the infection um, with this respiratory virus leads to an inflammation that um, needs to go across the blood-brain barrier in order to cause, cause an effect in the performance uh, um, in these tests. And um, also we found that um, just again, supporting this notion of, of this disruption of the blood-brain barrier, we found that um, if you um, track um, blue marker in the uh, brains of these animals, 
those animals infected with RSV, they show increased permeability of the blood brain barrier, as shown in this slide, post a three days and seven days post infection, suggesting that the, the virus can lead to the opening uh, or, the, or the lack of selectivity of the um, blood brain barrier. And that um, dye, dye uh, staining assay was uh, also consistent with the data we obtained when we looked at the presence of inflammatory cells in the CNS. Um, monocytes, B cells, and T cells could be found, could be found three days and seven days post um, expo exposure to the virus, suggesting that um, the blood brain barrier opening can lead to the actual uh, entrance of uh, immune cells to the CNS. And um, in vitro, we found that the virus, which is thought to be um, a virus that infects mainly epithelial cells, um, can also infect cells from the um, central nervous system, such as astrocytes. And here on the top, you see um, a recombinant RSV that becomes expressed the, the green fluorescent protein. So 24 hours in vitro is able to uh, um, lead to the infection of these astrocytes. And you see the cells shine, I mean, um, showing expression of the green fluorescent protein. Uh, we will also detect um, the viral F protein on the membrane of these cells and also the um, viral RNA, suggesting so that the, viral is a, the virus is able to infect these cells in vitro. Uh, which is kind of unique, thinking that this is a respiratory virus. So our hypothesis is that um, after infection of the lungs, some of the cells that are um, are that are driven to the airways um, because of the infection, some of these cells go back into circulation, and they could bring um, some of the virus. Um, two different areas of the body, including the CNS, the central nervous system, and by crossing the blood-brain barrier, they might lead to inflammation and potential um, damaging inflam inflammation in the, in the CNS, leading to this cognitive phenomenon that we found in this different, in, in, all, in all the tests we have performed in these animals. Um, and it's consistent to what's being observed in some cases of COVID-19. So SARS-CoV-2 might also lead to this inflammatory response in the central nervous system. So the, um, going back to um, SARS-CoV-2, we, we still have much to learn about this virus, but we know that the virus is able to infect and some people develop um, a hyperinflammatory response that contains several cytokines that are could be detrimental for the host and some people can just clear the virus without developing major symptoms. Still, as, as I said, it's important, important to, to, to just reinforce the notion that we know little about this pathogen and there is much research that needs to be done in order to um, make conclusions. But uh, the, the efforts worldwide for making vaccines against this virus have been really amazing. I mean, the science has been very, um, there are you know, several hundreds of um, different groups making vaccines, different strategies, going from inactivated viruses to recombinant uh, attenuated, attenuated viral vectors, DNA vaccine, virus-like particles, um, we are working on, on, on a lab attenuated recombinant bacteria, um, uh, recombinant uh, proteins, subunit vaccines, and, um, and also the chance of attenuating the, the virus. So um, when we decided to go into the, um, the, the, the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, um, we decided to focus on four different antigens on the protein E, um, the envelope, protein M, spike, which is the antigen that most groups are focusing on. And because of our previous experience with um, um, respiratory syncytial virus and with the metanumovirus, we also decided to work on a vaccine 
based on the nucleocapsid of the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we are currently working on four different approaches. Um, for each of them, uh, uh, including the four different antigens. So we're working on a recombinant attenuated bacterial approach uh, on peptide-based vaccines, um, and subunit-based vaccine, and a DNA vaccine. For each of those four antigens I mentioned in the previous slide. And um, one of the things that we noticed, um, and based on our, our previous work with the respiratory syncytial virus, is that an old vaccine, such as um, that's known as BCG, is the vaccine for uh, tuberculosis, the current vaccine for tuberculosis that is used in many countries, uh, might be an, it, it might be interesting um, to look into in terms of developing vaccines for SARS-CoV-2. Um, it's a safe vaccine, very immunogenic, it's able to trigger uh, TH1 immunity in humans. And um, the current use of this vaccine is um, pretty major in the world. So in blue, um, dark blue or, or light blue are countries that either are, um, are using this vaccine as a mandatory uh, immunization or an optional uh, immunization. And only four countries uh, do not use it, um, such as Canada, the US, um, Italy, and the Netherlands. And we found, uh, and this was published, um, we published this paper uh, in May, um, late April, I think was finally the paper out, uh, but there have been several papers after our papers showing that um, in during the first few weeks of the COVID-19 um, outbreak, um, countries that have a BCG program in general do better that do, than those countries that do not have a BCG program for um, tuberculosis. And this, of course, uh, depends on many factors. So, this, so we published this paper or this article um, just acknowledging that um, you know testing is, is a big issue of this data. The, 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 of course, the control measures that the country takes the public health system. But if we just focus on the first few weeks uh, af uh, after the outbreak was initiated uh, in each country, it was very striking that those countries that have a BCG program for tuberculosis in place have, um, um, I would say, less severe or less case number per million of uh, inhabitants as compared to those countries that do not have a BCG program in place. And that applied, as I said, for the case per million um, and also to the lethality of the disease. But again, this is only during the first few weeks when the, the when, where measures have not been taken and the public health system has not really um, become yet an, a factor on the discussion. So uh, the, the, the notion behind the positive effect of BCG has to do with um, the, capability, the, the capacity of this uh, vaccine of inducing a kind of immunity that is known as trained immunity. And that, that leads to changes in the immune cells um, after exposure to BCG that makes them prone to respond in a favorable manner to a viral infection. And this was shown uh, not only for, um, this is, seems not to be the case only for uh, SARS-CoV-2, but also for uh, other pathogens such as uh, other respiratory viruses. So um, the goal here is to prevent this um, enhanced detrimental immune response that is observed in some patients after um, SARS-CoV-2 ex exposure by um, immunizing with a vaccine that not only provides um, a specific adaptive immunity, but also is able to induce uh, immunity in, in what we call trained immunity. Um, so we are making progress on these four different approaches. We already have the recombinant bacteria for the four antigens. Uh, we have completed the preclinical studies with the uh, synthetic peptide approach. Um, 
and we have um, made progress with this DNA, with the construction for the DNA vaccines and for the uh, purification of the uh, proteins from the virus. And I will probably don't have time to go in detail and discuss all these results, but we have um, out of these four different prototypes, we have already um, uh, made preclinical progress with uh, um, two of them. And this was highlighted by this article in Nature in June, um, saying how important it is to work on vaccines. And, and in this article, they um, sort of uh, underscore the, the, the importance that countries work on the research leading to their own vaccines. And, um, and the, 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 uh, the journal um, highlighted the work done in countries like Mexico, Argentina, Brazil, uh, also Chile and others in Latin America in terms of making um, our own vaccines and also, you know, doing research leading to understanding the pathology and eventually uh, providing new information for improving vaccines. So um, in collaboration, we also are working in collaboration with different countries from Chile in terms of collaborate uh, on the clinical development of these vaccines. And we just recently put together an alliance between 11, uh, 11 universities uh, to create a network of uh, sites for um, um, research and development for vaccines and therapies, and also for clinical evaluation of these vaccines. And this, um, this consortium is, 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 is a very, um, it's, it's a great opportunity to contribute not only to this pandemic, but also to future uh, pandemics. Um, just thank you. I'm just, um, I just want to leave this slide in Spanish. So we were, uh, helados means ice cream. So we were having, um, this is my team, this is my lab. Uh, we have a nice um, uh, celebration uh, end of January. And then we haven't been able to, to be together again due to the pandemic. And hopefully that will, um, you know, and soon after a vaccine is available. So thank you very much. And I'll be um, happy to answer any question if you have um, questions after the talk. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexis, for such a remarkable lecture. We have enjoyed every piece of work you have presented. Now you have many, many questions to go through. And unfortunately, we don't have much time to deeply discuss them. But uh, please provide so short answers uh, to cover as many as possible. I, can you see me? Uh, I think my camera is off. I don't know why. But, I just uh, see your name. I don't see yeah, you. Yeah, just the name. Um, OK, uh, we can start. Um have uh, some questions about uh, your model, um, especially uh, especially on, um, on the CNS. So I will start. Could cognitive abnormalities be related to inflammation in the central nervous system? Does this occur only in respiratory infections? That, no, that, that is not only um, applicable for respiratory infections. In general, inflammation leads to the opening of the blood-brain barrier. Um, so that is something that, that was previously known. So the, um, there is a, a previous knowledge that um, inflammatory diseases in general can lead to problems in the CNS. So, for example, lupus has a whole area that is um, psychiatric lupus due to this uh, inflammatory systemic disease. Now, for the respiratory agents, this is kind of new. Um, there is a paper in Influenza showing um, also cognitive alteration in animal models. Our paper in, in, in respiratory sensational virus, and there have been several, I mean, many papers on SARS-CoV-2 showing effects on the central nervous systems of uh, patients infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2. So apparently SARS-CoV-2 is more serious than other respiratory pathogens at inducing uh, inflammation in the CNS. 
Okay, to what extent are learning behaviors inhibited by previous RSV infection? Um, so I think the first exposure to RSV kind of defined the way the, that individual will respond to it. Um, so if, so based on individual susceptibility, some people can deal very well with this with the first exposure, which usually takes place before two years of two two years of life. So people that develop severe RSV, uh, and we have a study that is um, that has been submitted for publication in infant, showing that severe RSV cases can lead to also um, detrimental uh, responses in, um, for example, learning some speech. Uh, sounds, um, but some people um, develop a good immunity after the first exposure to RSV, and they might not develop these um, uh, central nervous system or cognitive problems. So that we found in the animal models, if the animals are immunized, they have a good uh, TH1 um, virus specific immunity that leads to a little inflammation they not only develop uh, immunity, but also and clear the virus, but they also are prevented from suffering the cognitive problems. So I think it's, it has a lot to do with the uh, type of immune response that's been triggered by the virus or the vaccine to the virus. So if the, if the immune response is, is, is viral, is specific for, for certain antigens, in the virus, and they um, and the cells that are involved have most of a TH1 phenotype. Um, there is clearance of the virus without significant inflammatory damage, and that sort of protects the CNS. Okay, uh, is this impairment of CNS reversible or permanent? That's a great question. So, in in, in animals, we've been able to follow this up to six months post-infection. That's pretty long in, 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 a, in the life of a mouse. Uh, we think it's reversible if the um, individual, we have seen that in animals, for example, in the water maze test, uh, if, if they keep repeating the test, then they do better and they become, they become as good as the uninfected animals, suggesting that um, if training and, and repetition of the assays is, is done, then the, the learning capacities can restore, but it's, it takes more effort from an animal previously exposed to RSV to develop as good as, um, as an, an uninfected animals. So I think it's reversible, but it takes time and repetition of the assay or the learning is just uh, takes more, more effort and time from the individual. Interesting. How related, related is RSV infection and neural degenerative diseases? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Uh, we have not explored that, so we don't we do not know that yet. But there is more and more evidence every day that uh, diseases such as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's have a very strong inflammatory component. So if these pathogens not only respiratory syncytial virus, but for example, influenza or, or other pathogens that can lead to um, an inflammatory response that can influence the central nervous system, they might be, um, they might be contributing to the development of um, degenerative uh, central nervous system diseases. That is something that some of my students I have thought on evaluating. So we're planning to, um, but that's a whole new field and, and we need to uh, finish what we're doing at the moment before we go into those questions. But that will be very relevant because um, that, since anti antivirals are not very avail available for these pathogens, that will make even more important the, to have vaccines for them. Great. Then you have a number of questions about your, your model, your vaccine model. Um, I started uh, starting with this. By using B BCG as a vector 
for antiviral vaccines, you may promote innate training, you did, at the time of inducing adaptive immunity. Uh, so um, what about the engaging of the PRRs? Uh, virus and the vector are in uh, injecting PRR toll like receptors or right so so BCG has a very strong capacity to engage several TLRs mm -hmm. and that leads to a very strong innate immune response um, plus uh, on top of the innate immune response the antigens are well expressed so they can be seen by specific cells, T cells, um, um, in particular. So, so the, the anti-M presenting cells that are exposed to the recombinant BCG, they will present these antigens in a very immunogenic manner to T cells. So we get strong T cells, and, I, and you know, because of the time of the lecture, of course, we have all the data. Um, not only completed, but published for the vaccine, for RSV and for metanomovirus. Um, and we get very strong T cell immunity, uh, CD4 cells producing gamma interferon that, uh, and we published that last year, um, that help B cells to make um, antibodies that are high affinity and they um, are of the right isotype, IgG2A, which is required for clearance of RSV. So the, um, and, and that's the paper that I referred that we published last year. So we, we, we have pretty well characterized the, the, the T cell immunity that is induced by the vaccine. Uh, we, have well, we have characterized the B cell, the antibody response triggered by the vaccine after exposure to the virus. And we are beginning to look into the uh, trained immunity that might predispose T cells and B cells, but also cells of the innate immune system to respond uh, in, a, in a beneficial way for the host uh, against these respiratory viruses. That's because we think using BCG is a, is a, is a good um, option. Uh, thinking on immunizing early life, you could provide um, immunity against these respiratory pathogens and eventually also for SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. About this model, is viral transmission between infected animals similar to humans? No, in the case of the respiratory syncytial virus, we don't see much. Um, I mean, RSV is a very, um, it's a pathogen that is very well adapted to humans. Um, so I, the, the mouse model has, and the rat has been questioned as a model, as, a, as an animal model for human disease. So I don't think there's significant passaging from or transmission from mice, uh, from one mouse to the next. Um, but we have done a study uh, that we uh, completed uh, in, 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 in collaboration with, uh, the, uh, I, with, with Iowa State University um, in cattle, where we study a, um, the effect of the vaccine in um, response to the infection with a cattle RSV. It's called bovine respiratory syncytial virus. And there is passaging between uh, different animals. And we found that the vaccine is able to also um, induce immunity in those animals. And now we will follow those studies to see whether it can prevent or reduce transmission from one animal to the next. Yes. Could you give us your perspective on how the inflammation status, the morbid preconditions, can influence the clinical outcome of patients upon vaccination? Can you repeat the question, Rosanna? I, 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 um... how, how the inflammation status of individuals can influence the clinical outcome of patients upon vaccination? Right, so there is a clear correlation between um, excessive inflammation and negative prognosis. And that is something that uh, collaborators are looking into to able to uh, sort of um, have a notion how the um, individual will do 
based on the level of, uh, of certain inflammatory molecules. So th that's a very important area of, of research because since no vaccine is available yet, um, having a marker for prognosis is a very important um, component, not only for uh, respiratory sensational virus, but pretty much for each of the viruses that are, are, are major uh, burden for human health. And that we know is very important for the um, SARS-CoV-2 infection. Excessive inflammation might be a major player in the severity of disease. Right. What about uh, uh, the role of innate cells, particularly plasma cytoid dendritic cells and the interferon alpha related to them in, a, in your model? We have not looked at them carefully, but other groups have done that. And there is um, involvement of uh, different various types of uh, dendritic cells, both in animal models as well as in, uh, in, 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 in humans. So um, cells that produce gamma interferon are thought in general to be better uh, at, at controlling RSV infection. I don't think it's enough, there's enough information yet for SARS-CoV-2 regarding those questions. Yeah, now about CXCL10, uh, that is very elevated in, in, in patients, SARS-CoV-2 patients. We know the migration of CD8 cells and NK cells and uh, macrophages to central nervous system depends on CXCL10. Uh, and... Uh, Actually, CXCL10 has been uh, proposed as therapeutic target. Can you elaborate on this in your model? Is CXCL10 uh, having a role in the CNS uh, migration and impairment? That's a great question. Um, we have measured several um, cytokines and chemokines and um, thinking of CXCL10 as one of the targets is definitely something that we are considering to uh, look into. Um, as for SARS-CoV-2, it's, it's been more noticeable, but identifying those elements of the immune response um, during an inflammatory um, reaction to a virus might lead to uh, defining them as new target by using antibodies or drugs that can prevent their function. Mm -hmm. So that is something that we did in RSV and we have recently uh, resubmitted that paper. So that seems to be, uh, um, you know, clearly um, these cytokines and chemokines are important players for, uh, for the driving of cells into the CNS. Great. Uh, now we have this... Um Interesting question. With currently reported mutations in the virus, does the vaccine will still be effective? Yeah, that's a great question. We don't know the answer. Um, we don't know how important are those mutations, how different would be different pathogens, different versions of the virus that result from the mutations. But that sort of emphasizes even more the importance of making, start making vaccines in our countries because by having a, a vaccine platform, we could quickly modify the vaccine uh, and adapt it to the strain of the virus that is circulating in the country. Right. Rosanna, can I say something? There is a comment here in the in the um, in the chat. I think it's interesting. Is, of is, is, is worth mentioning. Dr. Ansari, he said that BCG is safe universally and already involved in many countries' vaccine program. Uh -huh. Some countries, again, okay. So uh, he's referring to something that I think is very interesting because this um, article we published about this correlation between BCG used and, and reduced um, 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 incidence of um, SARS-CoV-2 during the first uh, weeks of infection, um, needs scientific demonstration and that is being done in several countries that are currently doing uh, trials using BCG as a way to uh, protect um, some individuals with higher exposure, especially healthcare workers. 
And I think there are 11 or 12 of those trials now in place. So we will know from those studies whether BCG plays any role or not in those uh, clinically controlled trials. So thank you for that comment, Dr. Ansari. Yeah, uh, Dr. Meiti is uh, asking what ty typical central nervous system signs to be looked for COVID-19? Well, there have been several. Um, some might be more, I think first, first is we don't know enough about uh, SARS-CoV-2 yet. Um, there have been, I mean, several indication of um, pr situations like um, um, depression, um, seizures, um, various type of alterations. And um, it's, it's way more frequent than anything else has been described in all, for other respiratory viruses. But again, it's been little time, you know, nine months since the outbreak. So still, I think there's much to learn and to establish whether a, this is a real uh, phenomenon with um, clinical significance. But the, the amount of papers that have been out suggest that this could be the case, that could be of clinical importance. Well, one last question, two last questions. Uh, is revaccination needed to induce trained immunity to combat SARS-CoV-2? I think um, some of the vaccines that are in, in they are in, in some of the vaccines that are further advanced in terms of um, clinical trials, they require two doses. Um, so some of the phase three trials are planned based on um, not one, but maybe two um, immunizations, two immunization plus boost. Now, whether that uh, scheme of immunization will conduce to a long-lasting immunity, again, I think the jury is still out, we don't know. So we need to, um, you know, do research, clinical research in this case, to find out how long-lasting the immunity is, it is and whether a, a third or a new immunization would be needed. I think it's too early to tell. Okay, at last. Uh... Uh, your thoughts on how helpful is to use, would be to use, an immunological signature to predict the efficacy of this vaccine in different age groups? I think that's very important. I think the trials, they need to go along with a very precise measurement of the immune response. Remember that this is an uh, immunologically based disease. Uh, ex excess of inflammation can lead to severe symptoms in the patients. So the, 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 the type of, of immunological signature induced by the vaccine needs to differentiate from the signature induced by the virus itself. So I think that type of measurements are really needed in order to understand the mechanism of any of the potential vaccines that are moving along in terms of um, efficacy and, and, and immunogenicity. Okay, unfortunately, our time is over. Thanks again for the lecture and the audience also. Uh, we appreciate uh, your questions. Great reading you. Uh, again, we very much appreciate the IUIS opportunity. You all know that uh, webinars are on demand in the IUIS website. And please stay safe and take care and of also, your... Rosanna, thank you so much. <laughs> in 2022 for the best and productive experience. Thank you very much. Thank bye -bye. you, Ayo. Thank you, Alexis. Thank Goodbye, you. everyone. Bye -bye. Goodbye.